Falafala Yatu, welcome to the rock. Niwe Island. Niwe Fekai, Niwe Nukututaha. That means Niwe stands alone. I was born here, so to me this is home. It's uh, three and a half hours away from New Zealand by plane. And uh, we're self-governing under New Zealand protectoratship, which means we're a realm nation. And that's been the case since 1974. So essentially, as New Wayans, under New Zealand law, we're given the same rights as New Zealand citizens, both here and abroad. Prior to that, we were colonised and governed by New Zealand. To me, New Wayans always been happy. It's a peaceful place. Can't you tell? <laughs> but 70 years ago, yeah, that wasn't the case. There have been many different perspectives on this story over time. As a Nguyen, this is mine. Nguyen, 1953, population 4,600, one of whom was New Zealand High Commissioner Cecil Hector Larson, New Zealand's only diplomat to be murdered while serving overseas. It's an incident that changed Niue and all Nguyens. There's still a, like a sense of shame about it. And New Wayans, we still don't talk about it. Well, I think it's time we did. You couldn't write a television drama like this. What drives three young men to murder? They can't argue with what man. Savage beatings and sexual assaults. We only do something bad to our people slave labour and unlawful imprisonments. he make up his own laws and what else. He's a cruel person. A nation that spent years under the thumb of a tyrant. Larson had it coming. Growing up a world away in the meadows of the Manawatu, Larson's path to the Pacific started at Palmerston North Boys High School. A large fella, raised in a strict schoolboy environment, his fate and that of all New Wayans was set on a collision course when he began training as a cadet in New Zealand's Public Service Department. Rising up the rungs of the administrative ladder and spending time in Samoa and briefly New Wayans and the Cook Islands, it was December 28, 1943, when a hard-nosed and determined Cecil Hector Larson arrived in Alofi to take up the role of New Zealand's resident commissioner for New Wayans Island, a job that gave him complete authority to govern the country on behalf of the Crown. The Larson story has a sort of parallel for what goes on even today in that we feel that there are superior people who can run places. Um, and that's what we were seeing in the case of Larson. He wanted to go down to history as somebody who changed New It to the better. But the way how he went around it was uh, very bad. Across the serene seas of the South Pacific and overseen by the Department of Island Territories for New Zealand, most resident commissioners would usually only serve a term of three years. So either due to ignorance or a lack of care from the New Zealand government, Larson was left alone with no oversight to rule with impunity for ten years. And it's from this time, the tales of a tyrant seep to the surface. This is the New Wear Jail. As you can see, it's not used much these days. But back in Larson's time, he threw heaps of New Wayans in here. Over half the male population spent time in here for petty offences like swearing and shows of public affection, not keeping your lawns tidy. Man, if I was around in those days, I reckon I would have spent heaps of time in here. Oh, he's not a good person to work with. One day after work, I was on my push bike coming home. The Alofi South policeman caught up with me there and uh, he stopped me. I said, what had happened? Oh, 
Larson said for you to go back and pump in the water so that he could go to the toilet. I said no. The following day I went back to work, he sacked me. I used to go in the truck uh, to get uh, 44 gallons of petrol from the, from the farm. And that's where I saw how prisoners were treated. He kicked them whenever he was there when I went up. He'd make up his own laws and what else. Kick people whenever he's uh, in a bad mood. He's, he's, he's a cruel person. Well, the UN people have no other people to complain. Yeah, Lars in there is showing the white man's way. So talking to a few people on the island, I'm getting the picture that Larson was a less than cool dude. He did some pretty things. Arresting people for petty offences like swearing and, and drinking and using the prisoners to maintain his own personal gardens but not giving them drink breaks or rest breaks. He'd get the prisoners to chase his golf balls and return them. There's also a story of a soldier returning from Europe and Larson turning up on the wharf and making him strip his uniform in front of the whole island. The allegations around Larson whether he was sexually abusing or physically abusing these boys and, and men. If the families of those people want some kind of explanation for what happens, I think we just owe it to them as historians and writers and storytellers. Some of these men were prisoners who would come to be known as the Nguyen Three, men who would reshape the history of Niue and New Zealand. Folitolu, the oldest at 26, had a long list of ridiculous sentences doled out to him over the years by Larson. Lototama, the 19-year-old from the village of Tuapa, also went by the name of Suka. And Tamaele, the youngest of the three, from the village of Liku, was often referred to as slow learning. Mostly working inside Larson's residence, he was the one who suffered the most brutal treatment. Nguyen's are descended from voyages. We settled one of the harshest blooming places in the whole of Timuana Nui Akiwa. So when New Zealand sends an oppressive bully guy, there's only so far a people will bend before they're gonna break. On the 16th of August, 1953, breaking point came. Earlier that day, having been accused of stealing his liquor, Tamaele was once again brutally beaten by Larson. I think they've had enough, they have a gut full. No longer willing to take the inhumane punishments and their perceived disrespect for their beloved country, the sun was about to set and dawn the darkest day of New Zealand and New Wayan history. <laughs> After an evening at the theatre, Larson and his family returned home. They had dinner and turned in for the night. Little did he know, Politolu, Lototama and Tamaele had somehow slipped out of the prison and were now creeping towards the New Zealand High Commission in the darkness, each step moving them closer to freeing themselves and their country from a tyrant. That night, they wrote the history books in blood.
Leaving the children unharmed and the wife with only minor defensive injuries, the Nguyen three fled triumphant into the night. I think generally the people of Niue at that time felt Lazen had it coming. Niue is better now without him. He stay here for a long, long time and never do anything, only do something bad to our people. That's what I think. So, we know Lassen was an, a gentleman and that these guys had premeditated this murder. They planned it. But in the words of one of the killers themselves, would a good man die? As far as they were concerned, they were doing their country a service. They were doing it for Niue. I get that. If he is a good man, those boys never do things like that. They fled south, spending five nights on the lamb. At 5.30 on the sixth morning, they ditched their machetes, donned lays, picked up their Bibles, and gave themselves up, which began their journey through a confusing and complicated court case. It woke New Zealand up so badly that they didn't know how to handle the case. A closed three-day trial led by a judge and lawyer sent from New Zealand, some of whom had personal connections to Larson, completely disregarded all the ill treatments and found them guilty and sentenced them to death. They were being dealt with in a, in a white man's court of law. Having somebody's law to deal with you, you don't know anything about it, I don't think it's a bit fair. But on the basis of Larson's bullying behavior, a successful appeal was lodged by the Nguyen Three's lawyer. A new trial started on the 27th of October in Auckland, New Zealand. It all got mixed up with Larsen and the way how New Zealand run Niue. Yeah, how come that they have let that go on for a long time? Where were they, the justice system? How do they monitor their own people who are controlling Tukelo, Samoa, uh, Niue, and the Cook Islands. Everybody was in a shock. And when you're in a shock, you can't think properly. Yeah, so yeah, everybody has some funny ideas. Some who are very angry, some who are very soft, and some said, yeah, hang them, some said no. They were very confused. Everybody was confused. But there was no confusion in court they were once again sentenced to death by hanging. The men were flown back from New Zealand to Niue for their execution, but Niue didn't have any gallows. Um, so the gallows were loaded onto a Hercules, and then the men had to sit on the gallows as they were flown back. You couldn't write a television drama like this. <laughs> This is for Nuakula. It means red land. It was where they set up the gallows to hang the prisoners after they were sentenced to death. If it wasn't for an 11th hour stay of execution, this literally would have been red land. With increasing public pressure and in the midst of the Queen's inaugural visit to New Zealand, Sid Holland, Prime Minister of New Zealand, found himself facing a political nightmare. Still trying to execute the Nguyen Three, the rise of public opposition from all over the country, backed by the New Zealand press and deputations from organised groups, including the London Missionary Society, left him with little choice. Finally, the public and the Nguyen Three got what they had so desperately fought for, clemency. So this is where the Nguyen Three ended up. Mount Eden Prison here in Auckland. From a warm, hot, tropical paradise to the cold, grey, concrete blocks of Mount Eden. 
They became political prisoners, too complicated to kill and almost too complicated to release. In 1960, New Zealand tried to relocate them back to Niue, but there were too many mitigating factors. So they sat and they waited. In 1964, Tamaele, the youngest of the three, at age 27, was set free. Four years later, Loto Tama was released and began a new life in Christchurch. Fulitolu was the last to leave prison. In 1970, he moved to New Plymouth and, just like the others, led a law-abiding life. Tamaele was the only one of the New Wayne three to make it back home. Back here to our home village of Liku. It wasn't for long, though. After a few years, he got washed off the rocks while fishing. But hey, at least after all those years in Mount Eden, he got to die back home. This event changed Niue and Niueans forever. Larson left scars that would never heal, as did Tamaele, Lototama, and Folitolu. Perhaps these wounds are just something that comes hand in hand with colonization. Don't forget, you can't blame New Zealand. New Zealand is, is only a, a small country at that time, inexperienced. <laughs> but I think it's a learning point for New Zealand. And I think this is why New Zealand wants to make up about the decolonizing her countries. Sadly, Hector Larson is mostly forgotten, but the issues about how people get on with each other in the Pacific and in New Zealand are still there. A lot's happened since the death of Larson. Since then, there's been many resident commissioners, both loved and respected by the locals. In 1974, we became self-governing, which put the power back into the hands of the people. And who knows, maybe from here it's independence. A lot of New Wayans now call New Zealand home, myself included, and I think today New Zealand has a better relationship with its former colonised countries. But it's not perfect. Regardless of all that, when it comes to New Zealand and the Pacific, I think the more we move forward, the more important it is that we acknowledge our past. <laughs>